The Falcons shored up the trenches on day two, getting a long-term left guard as well as a long-term pass rusher at defensive end. We'll break it down on today's Locked On Falcons. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, you know me. I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black. And, of course, the very humble host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. If you've ever dreamed of becoming an NFL GM and managing your own football franchise, this is the game for you. Download the game by visiting ultimate-gm.com or look it up in the app stores and our listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when they use the promo code locked on in all caps in the game store. So guys, I want to thank every one of my everydayers that are up late on this Friday evening on the East Coast. For those of you that are everyday listeners from across the pond or throughout the world, that, you know, I have no idea what time it is and you probably need to get to bed, but I really appreciate the fact that you're an everydayer and you subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. So we're talking all about day two of the 2023 NFL draft where the Falcons went trenches, right? You know, a lot of people were annoyed with the Falcons ignoring the trenches on round one and, you know, they seem to, you know, always get that reminder. Hey, the draft is more than one round. You know, there's ultimate, you know, I'm sure people will forget that fact, you know, 11 to 12 months from now. But, you know, maybe those people started to calm down a little bit, seeing the Falcons shore up their trenches. Uh, in round two, they traded up for offensive linemen uh, out of Syracuse, Matthew Bergeron. In round three, they got Zach Harrison, the Ohio State pass rusher. We'll talk about Harrison a little bit later. But to move up for... Uh, Bergeron, they wound up giving up, I think, the earlier of the two fourth round picks that pick 110 in round four to make sure that they got their guys. There were reports throughout Friday morning and afternoon about all the teams that were looking to trade up in the draft. And the Falcons were one of those teams that, you know, various reports and rumors were saying were desperate to get back in the round one at the end of Thursday night. Uh, and some of those other teams that were, you know, linked to the trade-up talk, Tennessee, the Raiders, Tennessee traded up for Will Levis. The Raiders traded up for Michael Meyer, the, the Notre Dame tight end. And seemingly the Falcons traded up for Matthew Bergeron. He's going to come in, play guard for the Falcons. Uh, Arthur Smith did confirm that uh, you know, on Friday evening. Um, and so the expectation is he's going to come in. He's going to compete with Matt Hennessy. He's going to compete with Jalen Mayfield, potentially Justin Schaefer as well, for that vacant starting left guard spot where the Falcons, you know, let Elijah Wilkinson walk to Arizona and didn't really do anything to, you know, fill that spot. Uh, now, Bergeron was primarily a tackle in college, four years as a tackle in college, over 2,500 snaps at tackle, 75% of them coming on the left side of the offensive line. He did get four snaps at guard this past year um, and did go to the senior bowl and got some practice reps at guard as well, although he was primarily a tackle. Um, and so... You know, because we have another tackle convert, which the Falcons did last year with Wilkinson, with Mayfield, you know, we can't help but compare him to the last time the Falcons drafted a tackle on day two of the draft and tried to convert him to a guard in Jalen Mayfield back in the third round of 2021. And while I think Bergeron is fair to say he's going to be a bit of a project because that transition from tackle to guard is, is not necessarily one that is easy to make, but I think comparatively to Jalen Mayfield, this is a much, much better bet than the Falcons made previously with Mayfield, right? Bergeron's film in college, to me, based off of what I have seen, and you know, I haven't done a deep dive, so we'll do that over the course of the next month uh, when we get you know deep into the scouting reports and all that stuff. But my initial watching of Bergeron, you know, over the last several months, um, his college film was just better than Jalen Mayfield's college film was at Michigan. Um, the fact that Bergeron is a better athlete than Mayfield. Uh, Bergeron, you know, tested well. He had a 9.88 8 
RAS or RAS score, relative athletic score. He had good agility tests, 92nd percentile in the three cone, 63rd percentile in the short shuttle. Those agilities apply well to, you know, this outside zone scheme because you got to get guys that can get on the move and move laterally and whatnot. He had a good vertical leap. He has a basketball background from playing in high school basketball, uh, was late to playing football because he's from Montreal, right? So he was a hockey first guy. Um, but, you know, obviously was able to turn into a, a pretty good football player. Um, again, with the senior bowl, good week of practice, mostly at left tackle during that week. And, you know, going into the senior bowl, watching the film during the season, I was like, I don't know if he's going to be a tackle in the NFL. But then when he held up well in practice at the senior bowl, I was like, yeah, someone can plug him in as their tackle, uh, early second round pick, uh, possibly a late first round pick. Um, you know, I, I think that's going to work for him at the next level, but you're taking a guy that you thought could be a pretty competent starter as a tackle in the league, and you're going to move him the guard. So you feel really good about his ability to hold up in pass protection. You feel good about his run blocking. He's a finisher, right? He's a feisty, he'll get after it type of guy. So the early returns to me are promising with Matthew Bergeron watching the film. And again, I'll do a deep dive, but like the main thing with Jalen Mayfield and the main transition that you worry about from a, going from tackle to guard, that we talked about quite a bit with Mayfield when he was coming up was that playing on the interior is faster. So it's really about the hands, right? You know, tackle, it's about the feet guard is about the hands and like watching the film with Bergeron. And again, we'll see if this holds up once I get deeper and deeper into it, the hands are good for Bergeron. They were terrible for Mayfield. And that's why when we drafted Mayfield, like I was immediately like, I don't think this is going to work out guys. And obviously we haven't seen that come to fruition uh, uh, to prove me wrong in that regard. But because we have so much confidence in Dwayne Ledford, because I like seeing the Falcons, you know, we talked about this the other day with Ozzie Newsom versus Thomas Dimitrov. Are the Falcons going to double down with their current options at left guard, or are they going to recognize the quote unquote mistake with the earlier, you know, premium pick that they used at that position two years ago with Jalen Mayfield? And are they going to fix the problem now by drafting Matthew Bergeron? And they did that. And so I think the way you have to kind of see Matthew Bergeron is, you know, he's, he's, you know, again, we'll see if this comparison holds up once I go through the film uh, over the, the next couple of weeks. But like, I, I kind of see him as a Justin Blaylock type of player. Right. And with Blaylock, it took him to really to like his fourth year before he really put it all together and hit his stride as a starter where you felt good about paying him. Although I think the Falcons overpaid him, but that's a, you know, conversation for another day. Um, I th you're hoping with Dwayne Ledford and the coaching job that the, the Falcons offensive line coach can do that you can kind of see, you know, Bergeron get to that point in years two or year three earlier than what it took for, for Blaylock. So that's what we're going to hope for with, um, you know, Bergeron. I'm sure there will be, you know, some people being like, this was a reach. We didn't have to trade up again. I always laugh at the people that sit here and do all these mock draft simulators and think that, the mock draft simulators are reality rather than just one, you know, very, very, very rough guess of the draft of how the draft is going to go. And they somehow think when NFL teams don't conform to all the different mock draft simulations I did, you know, over the last three months, that means because NFL teams are bad at drafting. And it's like, no, the mock draft simulator is wrong, not the NFL teams, right? You know, so like, so I'm sure that, that will be a thing. Uh, but obviously, you know, if and when Bergeron's a plug and play starter, at that left guard position, you know, that that whole conversation will kind of go away. But we'll move on. We'll talk about the defensive end and Zach Harrison that the Falcons wound up taking in the third round. We'll talk later. Uh, I see some of you guys in the chat as we're breaking down live who you want, the, you know, the Falcons to take in round four. Some of you guys throw out Tyler Scott. We'll we'll, we'll circle back to that a, a little bit later on, on some uh, fourth round options for the Falcons uh, as we continue today's episode, guys. But first, I want to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by the Ultimate Football GN. And you've heard me talk about this mobile game. And, you know, as you guys sit here and think that, you know, you can outdraft Terry Fontenot, you want to test your ability to build up a championship caliber roster. And, you know, maybe the Falcons are making you happy and, and you, feel, you got that itch. Or, or maybe the Falcons are frustrating you and you still got that itch. Yeah, well, go ahead and play this game. It's completely free, Ultimate Football GM. You know, it's playable offline. You can hire coaches, coordinators, draft, free agency, trades, all that and more. Um, and, you know, it's a very challenging and realistic game. So it will certainly test you guys if, if you go ahead 
and and check it out but we're going to give you a boost uh to your your franchise 100 percent free uh if you use the promo code locked on in all caps in the game store that will get a boost to your franchise and if you just want to download the game head on over to ultimate-gm.com or look it up in the app stores again that's ultimate-gm.com ultimate football gm start your dynasty today so, guys, uh, as we continue today's uh, Locked on Falcons, before we talk about, um, you know, Zach Harrison, I want to give a shout out again to my everydayers that make us your first listen. And, you know, if, if you're everydayer, you know, go check out the Locked on NFL Scouting live show. I don't know if you guys checked it out on day two with Joe Marino and Kyle Krabs. I don't think Joe and Kyle are going to do the full, you know, day three experience on, on Saturday, but they will be back on the Locked on NFL Scouting page to give those updates, you know, after each round, talking about some of the picks that they like and all that stuff. And so maybe I'll pop in uh, here or there uh, to give my thoughts on the, on the Falcons day three picks as well. So make sure you subscribe to locked on NFL scouting with the draft dudes on YouTube so that you can get that coverage. But um, let's talk about round three and the Falcons again, went back to the trenches, went to the defense side of the ball, getting that big edge that we've been talking about. Like, you know, we signed Calais Campbell, but it's a one-year deal. Hopefully we can walk away from the draft with kind of his, Era parrot, the guy that we can groom to be a successor. And the Falcons decided Ohio State defensive end Zach Harrison uh, is that guy. And you understand why, because Zach Harrison, like Calais Campbell, is a massive human being, right? Six foot five, 200, nearly 275 pounds, or six foot five and a half. So I think he'll probably get listed at six six, right? He has an 85 and a half inch wingspan, over seven feet wingspan. That's 97th percentile among edge rushers. I think, according to mockdraftable.com, there's only been like three guys. Uh, in their, you know, data set that have longer wingspans. And, you know, that continues this trend that we've seen with this regime. They love, you know, length, right? Kyle Pitts, Taquan Graham, Felipe Franks, Adi Ogundeji all have like, you know, wingspans in that like 82, 83 inch uh, range. I'm sure Calais Campbell is up there, but because, you know, we don't necessarily have all the details on the combine data from 15 years ago, we don't quite know exactly what his wingspan is but he's going to be Calais Campbell's protege I think Harrison has the frame that you could see him getting up to like 285 290 if if, if the Falcons wanted to go in that direction he was uh 270 uh, or 269 at his pro day so you know there's room for the Falcons for him to get bigger uh tested well you know 8.7 uh RAS score relative athletic score he had good jumps uh showing that lower body explosiveness and get off as a pass rusher, uh, but he doesn't have great bend, right? He's, you know, he's a long, lanky sort of guy. He's not going to be a sort of speed rusher uh, that can bend the edge. He was 10th percentile in the short shuttle, 30th percentile in the three cone. We've talked before quite a bit on this podcast over the years that, you know, the correlation between um, pass rush production, sack production in the NFL and that three cone uh, when it comes to defensive end. So I wouldn't expect Zach Harrison to be a prolific pass rush sack artist. Uh, but he could be a, a pretty solid pressure guy. You know, I'm kind of expecting him, you know, to be a guy that maxes out probably four or five sacks a year, you know, 30, maybe 40 pressures a year, that sort of thing uh, it, it, with development. So we'll we'll see what Ryan Nielsen can do, right? He is a noted developer of, of defensive linemen, um, you know, similar to what we're talking about with Dwayne Lefford, the offensive line coach, Falcons, New D.C., and, and, and Ryan Nielsen did that for years at NC State, uh, New Orleans, uh, you know, only gets nothing but praise for his development for defensive linemen. So we'll see what he can do with Zach Harrison. Harrison has a lot of tools, right? He's the type of player that I typically am not a big fan of because I've seen a lot of these guys over the years, not quite with Harrison's, you know, physical tools, but close to it. You know, Ohio State had a guy, Jalen Holmes, a couple of years ago, who was a fourth round pick in 2018. There was a guy at Miami named Chad Thomas, who was a third round pick in that same draft. You had your Tur Gross Matos a couple of years ago, the second round pick for the Panthers. Like these big, you know, six foot five, 270 plus pound defensive ends that have, you know, tools, length, all these various things. But there's just something missing from their game that they don't turn into these super productive pass rushers. They just, you know, are solid rotational pieces. Holmes and, and Thomas, I think, you know, Thomas washed out of the league after two years. Holmes, I think, is a journeyman sort of back in rotational guy. Gross Matos is sort of a mid-tier rotational guy in Carolina. So, you know, that's the type of guy when I watch Ohio State with Zach Harrison, I'm like, yeah, this is the type of guy that NFL teams get enamored with, but then he just winds up being like a mid-tier rotational guy. But I'm hopeful 
that he can be more here in Atlanta with Nielsen's development and, and whatnot. Um, and so to me, like, I don't love the pick because like, to me, the player that I ex- kind of expect Harrison to be is kind of like what Taquan Graham was this past year, which is like a solid rotational player, but probably is not an ideal starter, right? Like Taquan Graham was probably like the third guy in our rotation when he, before he got injured, you know, after Grady Jarrett and, and Lorenzo Carter and like, you know, that to me is evidence that you don't have a good pass rush, right? So like Zach Harrison and and you look at Taquan Graham, he's probably going to be like the sixth or seventh best guy in the rotation now with all the additions that the Falcons have added this offseason and the jumps you're expecting from, you know, young guys like Arnold Epichetti. Uh, and that's kind of, that's that's right for Taquan Graham. I and mean, he can be a really good sixth or seventh man in your, you know, what the Falcons are probably going to have like a nine or ten man rotation. Um, and that's kind of what I kind of see Zach Harrison wind up being. And so that's going to be a guy that can be a contributor. But if he's one of your top three or four guys, I don't, I don't know if he's you're expecting that type of upside. So that's why I'm not necessarily, you know, like, oh, you know, fist pumping. But, you know, we needed an option there. I think Zach Harrison's a good option there. We'll see what he can do, you know, right away and what he can do with development. My expectation, you know, we've talked a lot about Calais Campbell, you know, only getting like 60 percent of the snaps. You know, if, if if Harrison is getting the other 40 percent, that works out to be about 25 snaps a game. So I'm expecting Harrison to probably give you like 20, 25 snaps as a rookie to sort of keep Calais Campbell fresh. And then, you know, in year two, if, if he shows promise, maybe, you know, get that promotion or the Falcons may bring in a, a sort of another sort of starter. And Harrison just kind of, again, a more of a rotational, but a good rotational piece. So we'll see how that develops with Harrison. Um and, you know, he he does have a little bit of experience lining up inside, but primarily was an edge rusher at Ohio State. But, you know, he, he's he's got the violence that the team is looking for when it comes to, the, you know, that defensive end spot. So there's 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 upside. So um, I'm hoping, you know, because I didn't do a deep dive on, on Zach Harrison, just watched a couple of games. And I'm like, yeah, this is this is a guy that's, you know, typically fool's gold in the NFL. But I'm hoping once I do the deep dive on film and I'll be like, OK, he's not the typical fool's go that I'm talking about comparing him to guys like Jalen Holmes and, and Chad Thomas and Yeter gross Matos. Like this guy's going to be a legit dude. So that's what I'm l- looking forward to. Once I do a deeper dive on the film uh, a little bit later, but we'll, we'll do a deeper dive on what my expectations are for the Falcons fourth round pick uh, and, and the other day three options for them as we wrap up today's uh, locked on Falcons day two reaction. We'll also, sort of look back at the Falcons overall strategy. And, you know, we talked about earlier this week, sort of what are we trying to learn from this draft class? And we'll, we'll get into that guys uh, to wrap up today's episode. But uh, before we get there, guys, you know, Saturday's going to be a long day, right? It's going to be a big gap potentially between the Falcons fourth round pick and their seventh round pick. And you got to keep your energy up, right? As you watch all these players that you wanted to see the Falcons draft, get picked by other teams and, rounds five and six and all that stuff before the Falcons are back on the clock. And if you want to keep your energy up, you got to check out the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. It's the best way to do it. That we're talking about built bars covered in hundred percent real chocolate, but they're low in sugar and calories high in protein, 17 grams of protein. They come in great flavors. You can order yourself a box uh, to test them out a mix box by going to built.com. Use the promo code locked on 15. You'll get 15% off your order, but you can also head on over to Walmart or Sam's club to get yourself a built bar box uh, a four bar box in the pharmacy section at walmart a 13 bar box at sam's club trust me guys you will thank me later when you have all that pep in your step when it comes to round seven on tomorrow's uh nfl draft so uh wrapping up today's episode uh before we get into the day three options for the falcons let's talk a little bit about what we've learned so far right and sort of the seemingly the falcon strategy you know day one was Hey, just get the best player that you can possibly get. And that that makes sense to me in round in the first round, you know, that's, that's your best chance to hit a home run. And I think the Falcons did that with B. John Robinson. Again, I know that's going to be a controversial opinion for a large percentage of Falcon fans. Um, But, you know, I think once we, we get to see B. John on the field, you know, the, the holdouts will, will, you know, join uh, the ranks there and and get on the bandwagon at a certain point later this summer. Um, and then day two, the Falcons kind of honed in on their needs. And, and that's where we really wanted to see the Falcons, you know, get and address the trenches. And, and to me, you know, I, again, I, I heard a lot of criticism for the Falcons not doing that at the top of round one. Understandable. 
But like to me, the, the strength of this draft really was kind of if you wanted to go trenches, it was kind of we, we talked about this, you know, in the lead up to the senior bowl, right? And after the senior bowl, it was like the kind of the sweet spot, you know, for edge, D tackle, offensive line was kind of like rounds two, three, and four, right? That's where the really strength of this draft class. There wasn't really that high end offensive lineman in the top 10. Like you could make a case for Peter Skaronsky if you really like Peter Skaronsky. Um, but like none of the tackles like Paris Johnson, Broderick Jones were typical top 10 tackles. You know, you had Tyree Wilson, you had Jalen Carter, you had Will Anderson. But like, you know, when you're starting talking about Lucas Van Ness and Nolan Smith and in top 10, like you're like, I don't know about that. You know, so like I sit there and I go like looking back now that you have the value of hindsight, like to me, you know, while I could sit here and, and nitpick, oh, I would have gone with Cody Mock in round two or I would have gone with Tommy Adabare in round three or whatever. Like the overall strategy makes sense. And, and, you know, getting a different player or, you know, you know, it's different flavors, right? It's, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to date myself when I use this analogy, but it's like, you know, you know, it's like complaining about, Oh man, I I got stuck with Carmen Electra and I wanted Pam Anderson. It's like, okay, like, but are you really complaining about Carmen Electra just because, you know, you had a slightly different preference, you know, blondes versus brunettes, if you're not getting drift on that one. So, um, you know, I think they, they got two solid pieces in the trenches, and I don't think either one of those pieces are going to be like the linchpin of their offensive or defensive line. Um, but, you know, I think Bergeron gives you some much needed stability at that left guard position. I I remember writing an article earlier this offseason at Falcoholic and the stat I recall off the top of my head was like since, you know, Andy Levitri, um in 2017, the Falcons have had like 11 different players start a game at left guard over the last five years next to Jake Matthews. And, and you know, you want to finish Jake Matthews his last two, three years or however many long he plays left with some stability there. And, and you now have some potential stability on this offensive line with a lot of good young players, including Bergeron. And, and Harrison gives you a really solid option in your defensive line rotation. And that's really the key with Ryan Nielsen. It's not, you know, obviously you're looking for a Cam Jordan type, um, you know, that can be that sort of dominant you know, difference maker, defensive player of the year, the guy that is sort of the anchor of that unit. And, you know, we have that for Grady Jarrett, but obviously, you know, Grady Jarrett's not going to play forever. And so you're you're looking for that player. Maybe that's Arnold Ebiketti. I don't think Zach Harrison's going to be that guy. But in, in New Orleans, it's it's not just about that guy. It's about, you know, the other pieces around him and having the rotation so that you can put your best foot forward and have, you know, an eight, nine, 10 man rotation and keep those guys fresh so that every single player on that unit is going to be able to give max effort every single snap down to down. And, and you're just, you know, go and hunt the quarterback, stop the run, all do all that more. And, and Zach Harrison fits that style, even if he's not going to be necessarily the, the, the dominant difference maker. But so I, I like the Falcons overall strategy, even if I wasn't necessarily these guys would be my preferred options. Again, they, you know, different flavors uh, uh, of what you're looking for. But let's talk about what the strategy is going to be on day three. You know, um, my guess, my best guess for what they're going to take at 113 is either going to be Tyler Scott, the wide receiver for Cincinnati, or Keechaw Clark, the cornerback for Louisville. I projected Clark, I think, uh, for round four in my earlier mock, full seven round mock draft earlier this off season, uh, this week, I'm sorry. Um, so that's kind of my expectation, but you know, they have options, right? You know, if, if they want to, um, you know, my expectation is we'll see them add more depth on the defensive side of the ball, linebacker safeties, two other positions. I, I could see them, you know, maybe waiting to around seven, uh, or potentially addressing around four. If they like the players there, there's going to be plenty of options there, uh, for the Falcons, but, you know, we'll see if the Falcons move back at any point tomorrow uh, in round four, you know, maybe recoup that pick that they gave up for Bergeron, you know, in, instead of it being a fourth round pick, uh, you know, maybe a fifth, sixth round pick or something like that. So just so they can get another body in the building. But it's been notable to see, you know, which guys slide every year. There's a couple of guys that people are projecting as like top 50 picks that, you know, slide to day three this year. You know, that list of names is like Keely Ringo, the cornerback from Georgia. Dewan Jones, the offensive tackle from Ohio State, Tommy Adabarie, the edge rusher from Northwestern, Clark Phillips, the cornerback from Utah, Antonio Johnson, the safety from Texas A&M. So those are some of the notable names. So if you're looking for that sort of home run pick in round four, you know, those are the guys that are like, oh, that's the great value type of pick. Typically, the Falcons don't really 
take those guys. They just kind of hone in on needs. We, we need a body here. We need a body there. So we'll see if they go corner. Again, I, I think someone like a Keytrail Clark could slide in easily and be that nickel corner for the Falcons. You have, if you're looking for an outside corner, someone like a Darius Rush out of South Carolina makes a ton of sense there. If you're looking for that safety, you know, Jamie Robinson has that sort of nickel safety hybrid skill set. That makes sense. Y- Yasir Abdullah, the linebacker from um, Louisville, or Owen Popo, the linebacker from Auburn, makes sense to me if they're looking for another sort of, you know, third linebacker that can give some depth behind Caden Ellis and, and Troy Anderson and potentially be their version of Michael Walker, that sort of versatile, uh, you know, linebacker or somebody like that. Of course, there's wide receivers, you know, everybody's favorite A.T. Perry from Wake Forest, you know, is a potential option. Trey Palmer, the Nebraska wide receiver. I'm sure there are probably a couple of other names in addition to Tyler Scott that you guys are thinking about. So there, there will be options. And the other thing we have to put forth is, like, even if the Falcons don't fill all their needs, they still have cap space, right? They have about $14 million in cap space, according to overthecap.com. According to overthecap.com, they need about $5 million of that to sign their rookies uh, based off of their current draft uh, situation. Um, and so that does leave you roughly $9 million that if you need to make a, you know, uh, go out there and get sort of a, a plug and play, you know, stopgap signing between now and the start of training camp, you have that room to do so. If you need to go out there and make a trade, you know, roughly – 10, 10 and a half million dollars is what you need to go out there and make a trade for a Corey Davis. I think uh, Tim Patrick, the Broncos receiver, you know, that's like $8 million, you know, so like the Falcons will have options to fulfill some of these issues, even if they don't, you know, get the guy that you want in round four or round seven or whenever they're picking. So there are still options. This roster is still going to undergo a lot of turnover. You know, um, you know, I think they're going to, you know, they're going to have to sign some undrafted free agents. So that probably means you'll see some cuts in a couple of weeks after uh rookie mini camp in, in mid-May. Um, and so that will be another opportunity to kind of turn the roster. So, you know, th- everything is not going to be over, you know, by 7 PM Eastern time Saturday, whenever the final pick in, in round seven, Mr. Irrelevant goes off the board. So uh, we'll, we'll still see some moves there. So I will, I wouldn't necessarily be too worried. If, oh no. If the Falcons didn't draft the guy that I wanted them to draft, blah, 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 blah the sky is falling. So we'll see what happens. Um, You know, Tyler Scott would make me very happy. If you're asking me like, who, who do you want in round four? Tyler Scott would be the guy bring some juice to this offense. Um, But, you know, I'm not going to complain if the Falcons, you know, add another piece on their defense. We we know that, you know, (laughs) they need to keep chipping away uh, on that front, but guys, that's going to do it for us here on this day two reaction pod. We'll be back tomorrow with more day three reactions. And then, of course, we'll keep it covered all week long, taking a deeper dive on these players as we break down more film, get more guests on the podcast to give their analysis, their thoughts on these players. We got several you know, college hosts here on the Locked On Network that can share some insights into some of these players. So I'm looking forward to those conversations with those people as well as people that love the picks, some people that may be a little bit more skeptical of the picks, We try to cover all our bases here on Lockdown Falcons. So continue to make us your first listen each and every day. Of course, subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts and continue to get more analysis on the Falcons draft pick, not only from here on Lockdown Falcons, but Lockdown NFL Draft with Damian Parson, Keith Sanchez, breaking that down. I'm sure I'll hear from those guys after the draft as well on the podcast and Kyle Krabs, Joe Marino on Lockdown NFL Scouting with the draft dudes as well. It's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.